That's what God wants us to be here in Memphis, Tennessee. We need to be a catalyst for spiritual awakening, and we do that by loving Jesus Christ. Good morning and thanks for joining us for today's program. Pastor Steve is in a new series called Live Like It Matters, and today he'll be bringing us a great message straight from God's Word. Have your Bibles ready and join us. We'll also enjoy some great worship from our choir and orchestra and our worship band. And if you're looking for some encouragement to get through the week, check out our audio and video on demand at Bellevue.org, where you can catch up on recent messages or you can worship with us right here at Bellevue. Be sure to follow us on social at Bellevue Memphis throughout the week for inspirational and encouraging stories. I'll see you in just a few minutes with more information about today's program and how you can get connected right here at Bellevue. Jesus, you change everything. Life here. 
We'll be back with more worship and today's message in just a minute. Each week, our ladies get together to enjoy a time of fellowship, worship, and a great Bible study from Donna Gaines and other gifted teachers. This fall, our study is in the book of 1 Peter. Join us for a few minutes this morning as we look into this encouraging letter and discover outrageous hope and extravagant joy. What we are looking at, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 12 this morning. And 4 and 5 are two primary verses I want us to really kind of hone in on. And it says, And coming to him as a living stone which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So we know that all of the Old Testament and even the temple itself was a physical picture of the place where God's presence dwelt. But in the spirit realm, once we become believers, we are grafted into the body of Jesus Christ and we become a dwelling and we are literally being built into a spiritual temple, a spiritual place of abode for the presence of God. And he dwells in us individually, but also corporately as we come together and we experience his manifest presence when we gather to worship him, when we gather to study his word or to hear it preached or taught. So let's start with verse one. Let's just start working through this passage together. Verse 1 says, therefore putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Now therefore we've got to go back to what we studied before, right? So when we look at the end of chapter 1, we're realizing who we are because we're in Christ and that we've been purchased not with perishable things but with the imperishable blood of Jesus Christ. And consequently, We are to live as believers, and we are to bring him glory and honor. And because we've been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is through the living and enduring word of God, we are to accurately reflect him to a lost world. But the only way we can do that to really live out what we're professing to believe is to examine our own lives in the flesh and ask, okay, Now that I know how I'm to be living with the hope and the joy that's to exude out of my life, let's step back for a moment and say, okay, I need to put aside, I need to take off, I need to put away malice. What is malice? I've given you some definitions of these words from Logos Bible Software. It's an active intent to harm others, like a plotting against someone else. Deceit, wicked, full of deception, hypocrisy. Well, obviously, if we're full of malice and deceit, we're going to be hypocrites, are we not? We're going to say one thing when on the inside we're really thinking and acting upon something else. Hypocrisy is a showy, empty display of religion. It's worldly. It's legalistic. In fact, let's look at Matthew chapter 23. Turn over to the left in your New Testament, to the first book of the New Testament. When you're reading passages of Scripture... Quite often there will be, if you have a Bible with cross-references, it will show you other places in Scripture where that same word is used. And this is one of those places, and it is where Jesus is speaking in Matthew 23, verses 5 through 7. And he's talking about some of the religious leaders. And he said, they love the place, no, five, but they do all their deeds to be noticed by men. For they broaden their phylacteries, you know, their scripture memory cards that they wore in the box on their head. And they lengthen the tassels of their garments, their prayer shawls. They love the place of honor at banquets and the chief seats in the synagogues. And respectful greetings in the marketplaces in being called rabbi by men. And yet we know even though they outwardly obeyed the word of God, their hearts were hard and cold. And they took advantage of widows and the poor. And Jesus called them on it. He called them on their hypocrisy. And so we need to be careful that we allow the Word of God to take root in our hearts so it changes the way we think, which changes the way we act. And we, too, are not hypocrites. Envy, resentment against another's success, or jealousy. Now turn back just a little ways to Galatians. And let's look at Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 20. Actually, through 21. And it's going to list envy and a list of other sins of the flesh. Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 19, it says, Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, 
enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like this. Now listen to this. Of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. If you can continue to practice sin and make it a part of your life without being convicted and desiring to repent, then it's evidence that you don't really belong to the Lord in the first place. You may only have head knowledge, you may have some religious knowledge, but you don't have an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. You haven't been born of the Spirit, because if the Holy Spirit lives within you, He is grieved when you sin. You can't hold on to the sin. You're going to be miserable, and the Holy Spirit's going to be convicting, not condemning, that's the enemy. Conviction draws us to repentance so that we can experience healing. And forgiveness. So we don't want to have envy. We don't want to resent somebody else's success. We don't want to, you know, say, oh, I'm so happy for you when secretly we're seething and we wish we were in their place instead of them, right? We need to literally, realistically rejoice with others because remember, we reap what we sow. And we are to mourn with those who mourn, rejoice with those who rejoice. We need to be a blessing to others and we, in honor, prefer one another over ourselves. And also we need to put aside, put off, slander, evil speaking, that which is morally injurious. Matthew 15, verse 18. You can get back there, and if not, I will just read it to you as soon as I get to it. Matthew 15, verse 18. But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart... And those defile the man. Now think about that. If malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander, all these are things that come out of our mouth, right? It's evidence of what is in the heart. Now I want us to pause just a moment and think about what's happening all across news stations right now and on social media. I wrote a post this week for Missional Motherhood um, and It really has a lot to do with how to live sanely in a world that's gone crazy. And the only way to do that is to be grounded in the Word of God, to immerse yourself in the Word and to live according to the Word. Our current climate, um, I mean, I believe women need to be respected, but at the same time I also realize false accusations can be thrown out and people try to get them to stick and people can be tried by social media instead of considering what we've always said is that you're, you're innocent until proven guilty whether it's the Brett Kavanaugh situation or anything else that goes out on social media, we've got to remember we are Christians. And first and foremost, we are to reflect Jesus Christ. And words that come out of our mouth are not to be unwholesome, but they are to be words that edify, that uplift, that encourage, that give grace to help at the, at the moment. So we need to be putting out there words that will bring peace, words that speak truth, words that bring unity and not division. We need to be very careful. In fact, one of the things I said was that the angry and vitriolic, that means venomous post on social media should never be attributed to Christians. There's absolutely no room for that. It lines right up with malice, deceit, slander, and envy. We are not to be a part of that. And that's what Ephesians 4.29 tells us. And if we are those who think on those things that are good and lovely and of good repute, if there's anything excellent, think on these things, what Philippians 4.8 tells us. If we're thinking on those things that are excellent, then what is good is going to come out of our mouth. So we need to be setting our mind on things above, not on things on this earth. We need to be immersing ourselves in the word of God and speaking words that will encourage. Because Colossians 3.17 says, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Whatever you do, everything you do in word and deed. We're to do as unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. 
shall prevail. Your word is stronger. We overcome. That's right. series of messages at Bellevue Baptist Church on live like it matters and your life does matter and how you live it matters we've already talked about several things we've talked about Bible intake like it matters we've talked about pray like it matters 
We've talked about spiritual warfare like it matters. And uh, last week we talked about connect like it matters, that is fellowshipping with other believers today. I want to talk to you about share Jesus like it matters. Jesus Christ is the evangel and he is the greatest soul winner and the greatest witness ever to be. And today we're going to look at a time when Jesus spoke to a lady that most Jewish people, especially rabbis, religious leaders, would not have talked to. She was a woman who was a Samaritan. She had lived a very immoral life, and she was living in immorality at the time Jesus spoke to her. And he came to this well at noontime, And it's very odd that anybody would come to a well unless they were a traveler like Jesus. It's very odd that this lady who lived there locally would come at noontime. That was not the time to come, but that's the time she wanted to come because she didn't want to be around anybody. She didn't want to have to hear people say ugly things about her and the way she had lived. She knew she had done wrong, but she didn't know what to do about it. But there was somebody that day that could help her. It could pull her out of the miry clay, set her feet on a rock, put a new song in her heart, a song of praise to her God, and that was Jesus. So this woman is a picture of so many people that are in Memphis, Tennessee, Shelby County, the Mid-South, all around the world that need to hear about Jesus. And you have Jesus in your heart if you're a Christian. And you have all it takes to go and tell them about Jesus Christ. Just like this video showed, you can go to people, and God's already got people out there who are waiting to hear the gospel. I want to say this to you. While God is working on you to get you to share the gospel, God is working on them to get them to hear the gospel. God's working on both ends. God wants you to share Jesus like it matters. There are many things Jesus came to do on this earth. He came to be the second Adam to be a perfect man. He came also to show us what God is like. He came to bring healing to people. He came to bring justice to people and all of those things. But the main thing was this. He came to bring salvation. He said as soon as he saved Zacchaeus in Luke 19, he said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. That's why he came. What good does it do if you get healed and you still go to hell? What good does it do if you get fed and you still go to hell? What good does it do if all the societal systems are changed and everybody goes to hell? Listen to me. Jesus came primarily to save lost sinners. And if you don't know the Lord today, you have not sinned more than Jesus can forgive. Jesus Christ wants to save you. Now, for those of us who are Christians... We're supposed to share Jesus like it matters, and it does matter. This woman was a Samaritan. Where did they come from? Back in about the 8th century B.C., we're told by historians and by Scripture that the ten northern tribes of Israel were taken by Assyria into permanent captivity. They never came back. They were scattered all over the world. And the Bible says that while they were gone, there were a few poor Jews that were left in the land of Israel. And the kings of Assyria then had people to come from foreigners from outside of Israel come, and they moved in to the land of Israel. And they started intermarrying with these Jewish people, and so they created a group called the Samaritans. Judea was in the south, Samaria was in the middle, and Galilee was on the north. And the Samaritans were hated. They were looked down upon by the Jewish people. The Jewish people said they are religious and ethnic half-breeds. We don't want anything to do with them. Everybody said that except Jesus. Jesus wanted something to do with them. You might think that God doesn't want anything to do with you, but I got news for you. God wants you. He wants you. He wants to do something in your life. 
And so those of us who know Christ, we need to share Jesus with lost people. Number one, if you want to share Jesus like it matters, you've got to trust God to position you. God's always working to put us in the right place. Look at verse 1. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, that's John the Baptist, and then he says parenthetically, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, verse 3, he left Judea and went away again into Galilee. Again, Galilee is in the north. It's my favorite place to go when we go to Israel. Judea is in the south, and right in the middle was Samaria. And most Jews, if they were north in Galilee and they had to go to Judea, they would not walk through Samaria because they were racially prejudiced. They didn't want to go through with those half-breed Samaritans. No, we're not going to do that. We'll go over to Transjordan. We'll cross the Jordan River. We will walk down on the opposite side, the eastern side of the Jordan River, so we don't contaminate ourselves in that Samaritan soil. And then once we get across from Judea, we'll cross the river again and we'll go right in. Or vice versa, if we're in Judea, we will not go north through Samaria. We'll go all the way trans Jordan, across the Jordan River, and we'll go up the other side on the east side. And then when we come to Galilee, we'll cross the river again and we won't be contaminated. They had it all figured out. But Jesus said, you know, I think I'll just go through Samaria. Look at verse 4. Jesus, totally unprejudiced, he had to pass through Samaria. He was not a racist. He was not going to avoid that part of the country. You know, some people avoid that part of town. Don't go to that part of town. How many of you know that God loves everybody in the town? Everybody know that? Yeah, yeah. Even your part. Jews may have hated Samaritans, but Jesus didn't. He loved them. Verse 5, so he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph, and Jacob's well was there. It's still there. You can drink water out of it. Still there. Parcel of ground, famous, it's still there. And then John shows us Jesus' humanity. He says in the latter part of verse 6, So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. That's high noon. I don't know when it was, but apparently it was hot. Jesus was tired. Jesus was thirsty. Almighty God in flesh. He was 100% God, 100% man simultaneously. He was all God, all man at the same time, and sometimes he would get tired, and sometimes he would get hungry, and sometimes he would get hot, and sometimes he'd get thirsty. And so he sits down. It's high noon. He just wants some water. He's right where God had him. Sometimes somebody interrupts you, and you get so mad, and God said, wake up, games. I want you to talk to them about me. You ever had a flat tire? Who likes a flat tire? I don't like flat tires. Whom it goes out and you're saying, oh man, I don't have time for this. God said, maybe your schedule's not yours. Maybe I got somebody right over there that's going to fix your tire that you need to tell about Jesus. Somebody calls you and you say, I don't have time for this. And God says, you got time to do my will or do your thing. God is positioning you sovereignly, supernaturally. I don't want to move. I want to stay in the house I'm in. I want to stay in the neighborhood I'm in. I want to keep the job I've got. God says, no, i got something better for you. i got something different for you. I'm going to do a new thing in your life. Forget what lies behind. Reach forward to what lies ahead and press on. I'm going to do something new. God is constantly, sovereignly, providentially putting you right where he wants you. You say, I don't like my job. Your job is not just a job. Your job is a ministry. And you need to be praying for those people. God put you there. You just need to, all you need to do, all I need to do every day is report for duty. Private gains. You're not a general, by the way. And neither am I. Private gains reporting for duty. God wants to position you and put you in the right place so you can share Jesus with lost people. He's got a bigger plan than you know about. Secondly, you need to engage in ordinary conversation. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, 
give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Now, if that had been some of us, we'd have said, you know, I'm a Jew, you're a Samaritan. Did you know we're different? We'd like to talk about our differences. You know, you know, I know all about you. You've been, you've been married several times, haven't you? You got a problem, don't you? Jesus didn't do any of that. He didn't talk about religion. He didn't talk about race. You know what he talked about? Redemption. You need to engage the people around you. Wherever you are, be all there. Let's say that together. Wherever you are, be all there. Wherever your feet are, that's where you need to be. You need to be focused. You need to be laser focused because God's got people around you at that moment that he wants you to engage. You need to talk with people. Engage them in ordinary conversation. Number three, if you're going to be sharing Jesus like it matters, you've got to transition now into a gospel conversation. You're not there just to talk. You're there to talk to them eventually about Jesus. Now, you try to get do as much as you can. You may not be able to unload the whole load, but you've got to start with your testimony, start with some gospel, and share as much as they will receive. You've got to transition. Notice how Jesus transitioned in verse 9. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you being a Jew ask me for a drink since I'm a Samaritan woman? Jews have, John says parenthetically, Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. The woman just acknowledges the elephant that's at the well. (laughs) Why would a Jewish man be discoursing with a Samaritan woman? That's just not done. Men don't talk to women that much, and, you know, to be frank with you, Jews never talk to Samaritans, so she's just floored. But Jesus refused to be dragged into an argument. He said, if you knew, verse 10, the gift of God, who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him. He would have given you living water, living water. You know what that is? That's water that flows. It's not just water connected or collected in a cistern it is that flows into a well he said ah we're at a well this is living water you need living water you need real living water you need the holy spirit you need a drink of the water that i can give more than i need a drink of the water that you can give you need what i have jesus told her in no uncertain terms that her well was empty And he could fill it up. She said to him, sir, verse 11, you have nothing to draw with. The well is deep. Notice Jesus is speaking on a spiritual level. She is on a temporal, earthly level. Where then do you get that living water? You're not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle. And then Jesus presses in and starts to share the gospel. Look at verse 13. He transitions. Jesus answered and said to her, everyone who drinks of this water that you've got here in this well will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst, but the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. The water that I give is better than the water in this well. The Holy Spirit is what I'm talking about, and that's what he talked about later in John chapter 7, verse 38, when Jesus said to a bunch of Jews, he said, he who believes in me, as the Scripture said, from his innermost being, the King James says, from his belly will flow rivers of living water. When you get saved, the Holy Ghost lives in your body, and he starts to flow out of you, and you've got that river that will flow out of you, and it will literally change your life and all the people around you. But this woman is still on that lower level. She says, oh, you're telling me that I, I won't ever have to come to this well? I, I won't have to draw water? How is that going to happen? Any way you can tell me that I don't have to come out here and draw this water. I don't have to hide from these people all the time. I don't have to lift these heavy buckets. Yeah, I'm all in on that. She said in verse 15, the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty, nor come here 
all the way here to draw. He transitioned into a gospel conversation. I got a lot of friends that are good at witnessing. I don't have anybody that's better at witnessing and sharing Christ than Bill Street, guys on our staff. We met each other 30 years ago. We were young pastors then and uh, in Jackson, Tennessee. We went to a meeting. We were the only people that were young back then. And, uh, and, and we, we looked around. We said, we better get to know each other. <laughs> and we did, and, and we've been friends ever since. I don't know of anybody that's more evangelistic than Bill. He leads somebody to the Lord about every week. And it's because he knows, I've seen him do it a hundred times, he knows how to take a regular conversation and transition it into a gospel conversation. You say, preacher, what's the key? If I could give you one key, because you don't want to just sit there and talk to death. You know, most men, especially after you've talked about five minutes, you're out of gas. Amen? I mean, ain't nothing else to talk about, all right? I know you ladies don't have a clue about what I just said. I get it. But these men, and you too, ladies, you've got to know how to transition. You've got to know how to transition. The best way to do it is talk to them, say, you know, where do you work? Tell me about your family, all that. Great. But then ask him this question. Here's the, here's the question that, tra- that changes everything. Ask him, where do you go to church? Oh, now you've changed everything. You're either going to get a big green light. You might get a yellow light. You might get a red light. If you get the green light and they go right into it, well, I don't go to church or, you know, I... I, uh, I go to church, but it's been a long time, or I'm not, we're looking for a church, something like that. You kind of know which way to go. If they say, I don't go to church, I don't want anything to do with that, then you don't just press in. You just say, you know what, hey, amen, I just, I just want to know where you're going to church. And you just keep talking. You know why? Because you want to leave them open enough to hear somebody else down the road. You don't get mad at them. You don't start yelling at them. You don't, you know, tell them that they're going to hell and all that. But you do engage them and you transition into a gospel conversation. Number four, if you want to share Jesus like it matters, you discuss sin and salvation. You can't just talk about heaven. You've got to talk about sin and salvation. Look at verse 16. Jesus starts to drill a little bit deeper. He said, okay, go and call your husband and come here. The woman answered, I don't have any husband. Now, she answered, what she said was truth. It just wasn't the whole truth. She was covering. She was hiding. She was hiding from Jesus. She was hiding from anybody. She was coming at noon to the well. She was hiding. And some of you are hiding right now. You're hiding from the people that know you. You're hiding from others at work. You're hiding from your family. You're hiding from God, you think, and look at me, you can't do it. God knows right where you are. No sense trying to hide. When Adam and Eve hid themselves, God walked right up to the bush they were under and said, uh, how's it going in there? <laughs> That's the Steve Gaines translation. It'll be out in about 2040, all right? How's it going in there? He knew exactly where they were. Exactly. He knows right where you are. You're not hiding from God. She was trying to hide. I have no husband. Jesus said, you're, you're, you're correct on that one. You have no husband. You've had five. And the one whom you now have, you're living with, is not your husband. This you've said truly. We don't know if her husbands had divorced her. Back then a woman couldn't divorce her husband for anything. And a man could divorce his woman his wife for anything. It was so unfair. Maybe some of them had died. But the text leans toward the fact that she had been immoral with them just like she was being immoral, cohabitating with the man she was with at the moment. And Jesus, you got to understand, he confronted her. He was saying, if you want living water, you're going to have to deal, we're going to have to deal with this sin. You know, my own mother was divorced. And she repented of it. 
She married my daddy. They lived together almost 55 years. I believe God forgave her. Now, if you are divorced right now and you have not remarried, my advice to you would be to try to mend your marriage. Even if there's been infidelity, I think you'll be better off that way. If you've already remarried, there's nothing you can do about it except give it to God. And look at me, walk in the grace of God. Walk in the grace of God. Now, if you're cohabitating with somebody right now, and you're being romantically intimate with them, you're living in sin. It's called, if you're a man and woman, it's called fornication. If you're a woman and woman or a man and a man, it's called homosexuality or lesbianism. And all of that is sin. And you need to move out, one of you does today. It's never too late to start doing right. You need to move out. And either get married only if you're heterosexual. If you're homosexual or if you're a lesbian, you're not to get married. You're not to be committing those sins. So Jesus has a little come to Jesus moment with this woman. And the Bible says that uh, he literally confronted her about her sin. The woman said, I perceive that you're a prophet. She's going to get in a religious argument now. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain. You people say that it's it's in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus would have none of it. He said, you're not going to get me off in that religious quagmire stuff. No way. He said, her woman, can you hear him say, woman, (laughs) believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in the Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You Samaritans worship what you don't know. We, Jews, worship what we do know, for salvation comes from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is. Jesus said, there's a brand new day, lady. An hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers, the true worshipers, if they're true worshipers, they're false worshipers. The true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be His worshipers. There's a whole sermon there I don't have time to preach. I'll preach it another time. God is spirit. And those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. It is not where you worship, it is how you worship. And whom you worship that matters. He discussed sin, He discussed salvation, and that's what we have to discuss today. I want to say this to you, God loves you, He loves me, but we're all sinners. All of us, like sheep, Isaiah 53, 6, have gone astray. Each of us has turned his own way. There's sin when you do it your way instead of God's way. That's sin. The essence of sin is selfishness. I'm going to do it my way. I did it my way. Yeah, and you sinned the whole way. All have sinned and come short. It's like an arrow falls short of the mark. Short of the glory of God and the wages, the just penalty of sin is spiritual death. The reason you feel separated from God is because you are. His hand, Isaiah said, is not so short that He cannot reach you. Nor His arm so weak that He cannot come to you, but your sins have made a separation between you and your God. You got to talk about sin. You got to talk about salvation. But Jesus stepped down onto this earth and lived a sinless life and died an atoning death and rose from the dead so that you can have eternal life and you can be forgiven. And if you'll trust in Him, you can be saved. Now we're getting somewhere. Jesus had to confront the woman and discuss sin and salvation very quickly. Number five, if you want to share Jesus. Point people to Jesus. Look at verse 25. The woman said to him, I know that when Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ, when that one comes, he will declare all things to us. In other words, let's just get real high and mighty about this. Oh, whoa, mystery, mystery. We don't know about all this. Oh, one of these days, God will all know by and by. Jesus wouldn't have you. And they said, hey, lady, look, 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 look. I who speak to you am he. 
You're looking at him. I'm the Messiah. Do you know that Jesus hardly ever said that? When the religious leaders would ask him, because they wanted to throw him in jail if he said it, if they said, are you the Messiah, are you the Christ? He would just kind of give them a sign, and he wouldn't lie, but he would, he, would, he, would, he would move over here and talk back a little bit this way, but he would never come out and say, I am he. Later on, at the very end, when he was about to be crucified, they said, are you the Christ? He said, I am. And they killed him. But they didn't kill him. He gave his life to the Father. He died on his own accord. I who speak to you am he. At this point, the disciples came. They were amazed that he'd been speaking with a woman, yet no one said, what do you seek? Why do you speak with her? So the woman left her water pot. That's why she was there. She'd been saved. Jesus had changed her life. Somehow she had repented. She had believed when he said, I am he. All of a sudden, she had faith. She repented of her sin, and she put her trust in Christ. And now the first thing she wants to do is tell somebody else. She went to the city. She said to the men, come and see a man who told me all the things that I've ever done. And I can see all those guys who had been with this woman. Their eyes were as big as saucers. They said, uh-oh. <laughs> told him everything you've ever done? Uh-oh. This is not the Christ, is it? Then They went out of the city and they were coming to Jesus. Why did Jesus say, I am he? Because he is the only one that can save. He said in John 14, verse 6, the night before he died, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Now, what does that mean? It means what it says. If you don't know Jesus, you don't know God. There's only one way to God. That's why Peter said in Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved except the name of Jesus. That's why Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 2.5, there's only one God and there's only one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. There are not many ways to go to heaven. There are not many saviors. Jesus is the only savior. Jesus is the only way to God. Jesus is the only one who can forgive your sins and take you to heaven. Then sixthly, if you're going to share Jesus, you've got to stay focused on sharing Jesus. Don't let anybody sidetrack you. Verse 31, meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, get something to eat. You know, in the most spiritual moment, some Baptist comes up and wants to feed you. Amen? I mean, a woman about to get saved. Hey, hey, preacher, let's eat. Let's go eat. Yeah. It's a wonder we don't all die of overeating. But he said to them, I have food to eat you don't know anything about. I love that. So the disciples are saying, no one brought him a sandwich, did they? Something to eat, did they? Jesus said, my food is to do the will of God, him who sent me, and to finish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months? Then comes the harvest. It only takes four months from planting the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes. Look. Look on the fields. He's talking about the people They're white for harvest. There's people all around you. Already he who reaps is receiving wages, gathering fruit for life eternal, so that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this case the saying is true. One sows, another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored. He's talking about John the Baptist. You have entered into their labor. Jesus just stayed focused on sharing Jesus. I'm not, I'm not, I don't want any food right now. I got food to eat you don't know anything about. And I want to tell you this, you lead somebody to Christ and you won't care what you're going to have for lunch. You lead somebody to Christ, you won't care how much time it took. It's kind of like a baby born, took all night, it was worth it. You just keep on staying focused on sharing Jesus Christ. And number seven, you want to share Jesus like it matters? If you do that, sooner or later you're going to witness God's abundant grace. Look at verse 39. From that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. 
He told me all the things that I've ever done. All she did was go back there and tell her story. And you know what? Some of you are scared. You say, I don't know enough. I don't know if I know the gospel. Look at me. Just tell them what Jesus did for you and then invite them to church. She didn't, she didn't share the whole gospel. She just told them what happened to her and she brought them to Jesus. You may not be able to tell anybody the whole gospel and you may not know the outline and all the verse and all that, but that doesn't keep you from telling me, say, hey, I used to be this, but now I'm this because Jesus changed me. I used to be a liar, but now I tell the truth because Jesus saved me. I used to be immoral, but now I'm walking in purity because Jesus saved me. I used to be mean, but now I'm as nice as I can be. You know why? Not because of me, but because Jesus saved my soul. Tell people, I used to be this, then he came, now I'm this. It's all to his glory, and then bring them to a church and let them hear about Jesus. You can do this. She did it. And the whole city was changed. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them. He stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his word. They were saying to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we've heard ourselves. And we know that this is the one. This is the one, the Savior of the world. They witnessed God's abundant grace. Do you understand that there are people all around you? There are these little women at the well, and they're hurting inside, and they're trying to hide their sin like Adam and Eve, you know, and they don't know that there's the Son of God who left heaven to save them, to live on this life, on this earth, and to live a perfect life and then to die on the cross and bear all their sins and then go to the grave and come out with the keys and never to die again and to rise triumphantly from the grave and then to offer eternal life, to ascend to the Father and offer eternal life through all the preachers that have anything to do with the Bible. They share the gospel of Jesus Christ and not just the preachers and the pastors but the members and we tell people about Jesus. Do you understand that God loves you? He wants to save you and if you'll repent of your sins and believe savingly in Jesus right now you can be born again and the moment you are all your sins are washed away that heavy load is gone you quit hiding and all of a sudden you're a new creation in Jesus Christ all because somebody had the wonderful insight to share Jesus with you don't you think you need to do that yourself let's pray God I pray Lord, I pray that we will tell people about Jesus. And I pray if there's somebody here that doesn't know the Lord, they'd be saved right now. Thank you so much for watching. And the reason we have these broadcasts primarily is to tell people who don't know Christ as Lord and Savior how they can be saved and how they can come to know God through His Son, Jesus Christ. I want to remind you that God loves you. He loves you, the Bible says, with an everlasting love. And He loves everybody in this world. For God so loved the world, the Bible says. He loves you. But the same Bible says that you're a sinner. That's spiritual law breaking. You have broken the laws of God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages or the just penalty of our sin is death. And it makes us spiritually separated from God. But the beauty of Christianity is this. God doesn't expect us to swim out of our own ocean of sin. No, he doesn't expect us to save ourselves. When we were drowning in our sin, Jesus came to us. And the Bible says that God loved us so much, he sent Jesus to die on a cross for our sins, to pay the penalty, and then to be raised from the dead, that he might give us eternal life. And if you will believe that, if you'll receive Christ, He can save you right now. You have to repent of your sins, believe in Jesus, and ask Him to come into your life. And if that's something you'd like to do right now, I'd love to lead you in that prayer of commitment 
And you can pray and tell the Lord that you want to be saved and ask him to be your Lord and Savior. If that's what you want right now, pray this with me right now where you are. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, thank you that you love me. I am a sinner. I cannot save myself. I believe that you died on the cross for me. I repent of my sin. I turn from my sin. I believe that you not only died for me, but you rose from the dead. And Lord, I receive you into my life. Save me right now, Lord Jesus. Wash me and cleanse me and help me to live for you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, dear friend, if you just prayed to receive Christ into your life, the Bible says that angels are rejoicing and we at Bellevue would love to rejoice with you as well. There's a toll-free number on your screen. Someone is waiting here at Bellevue to pray with you, to rejoice with you, and to be blessed by hearing about your conversion to Christ. We're going to send some materials to you to help you get started in the Christian life. And if you need a Bible, let us know. We'll send one to you absolutely free. And then you still have time to worship with us here today at Bellevue Baptist Church. In just a moment, you'll see the location and also the times. We'd love to have you come today. God bless you, and I rejoice with you that you've given your heart to Jesus Christ. If you're in need of spiritual help, call us at 1-866-347-5431. There are caring people waiting right now to take your call. For more information about Bellevue, explore our website at bellevue.org, where you can catch up on recent messages from Pastor Steve and other great speakers through our audio and video on demand. Or follow us on social media at Bellevue Memphis throughout the week for inspirational and encouraging stories. And tune into our live webcast every Sunday at 920 and 11 a.m. and Sunday evenings at 6 p.m. We'd also like to invite you to join us for worship this Sunday here at Bellevue. You're always welcome, and there is a place here for you and your family to connect. Check out Bellevue.org for a complete list of worship times. Thanks for joining us for today's program. We look forward to seeing you soon.